Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about the class E amplifier by building such a circuit and testing it out. I will continue working with the circuit we started designing last time and try to put it into practice just to see how well these simulations match up with real life. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So last time we started working on a class E amplifier that can amplify 5 MHz and output it into 50 ohms. For this you don't just need the class E power stage but also an extra impedance matching stage because of the specific output power and supply voltage. But what else do you need for the practical build? So what I have here is the schematic for the build. It's based on the SI2304 N channel MOSFET transistor that we used in the simulator. I used a 330 microhenry radio frequency choke, which is a different value than the one we used, just because this is the component that I actually had lying around. Other than this, to make sure that the gate receives nice sharp edges, I used a logic gate. So this is a trigger Schmidt buffer circuit, which should be able to supply the gate with nice and sharp edges, regardless of what is on the input. If we come back to the circuitry, all of the capacitors have been doubled, so there's two footprints, one next to the other. And this was quite important, because this was the only way in which I could obtain the values that we had in the simulation. So most of the values that we got were not standard values, so I had to resort to combine different value capacitors to get the desired outcome. Now, the inductors are also doubled, and while well, I don't have two inductors, this was just done to have two different footprints to be able to play around with. The inductor values are the ones that we simulated. Finally, to supply the circuit, there are two different supply lines. So one is dedicated to the power stage, and the other one is for the gate driver. So these two are separate, they are filtered independently, and the reason to do this was to be able to measure the power draw by each part of the circuit. If we now turn to the layout of the board, well, it's a small 5x5 five five centimeter board, and in hindsight, I should have made it a bit larger. But anyway, if we start from the top, here we have the supply connector for the gate driver, so this gets filtered, goes through some capacitors, a filter inductor, and then into the gate driver IC, which is quite a small component. This is where we have the input signal as well. This goes into the power transistor, which has the various inductors and capacitors, finally being connected to the output connector. And the power transistor is also supplied through the other connector, so through this other line. And this is how the complete board looks like. The massive towers are the inductors. I used air core for the coils to be able to precisely control the inductance. And well, now it might be a bit more clear why the board should have been just a bit larger. Because of their size, the two inductors are very close together. Eh, let's see how it works. For that, I prepared the setup in which I have my circuit. Both supply lines are supplied from the 5 volt supply. The input is connected to the signal generator, which is set to output a square wave, and the output goes through a 50 ohm 20 decibel attenuator, which then goes into a 50 ohm termination. And this is the point where we're measuring it using the oscilloscope's first channel. Now, because the probe is X10, it attenuates by 10, and it's connected to an attenuator that also attenuates by a factor of 10, the probe is set to X100. And finally, to perform the various measurements, I will be using a X100 high voltage probe, not necessarily because we're working with high voltages, but rather you can get relatively cheap high voltage probes that have very small probe capacitance. So our circuit is quite sensitive to added capacitances, and this probe has less than 10 picofarads, so it should have minimal impact when we're probing the circuit. So first things first, let's supply the circuit, turn on the input, and it works. So we can see our 5 MHz output signal, it's a sine wave, so on the surface at least, things are going well. Let's now look at our control signal. So first of all, in blue, we can see our input signal, so the one coming from the signal generator. It's not perfectly in phase with our output signal, and that's perfectly normal. Then we can have a look at our gate driving signal, so we can see that the edges are relatively sharp, although they are curving a bit at the top and bottom end. So this is because of the capacitance of the 
transistor. And well, if we now focus on the output waveform, we can see the RMS value already calculated, 2.9 volts, which going into a 50 ohm load is about 170 milliwatts. Just a bit shy of the 500 that we were aiming for. Now, to get an idea of what's going on or what might be wrong, next thing we can check is the switching node. So when we do this, we need to rescale a bit, the signals are quite large, it looks fairly okay, but if we zoom in a bit, we can see that the signal doesn't really curve back to zero, but rather it's still falling at a quite a steady state when the switch is turning. So there might be some adjustments needed to get this waveform to look as expected. Now, I am going to spare you of the various iterations I tried. It's quite a tedious process, change component, measure, change component again, measure again. It takes the time it takes, but eventually, if we fire up the circuit, we can see a much nicer 4.18 volts RMS on the output, and the switching node looks a bit more like expected. So we can see the waveform nicely curving as it reaches zero. So it's not perfect, but it's as close as I will be getting it today. And this was achieved with the components that are highlighted on the screen. Now, while playing around with the circuit, there are a couple of things that I've noticed. So first of all, the ideal components are not the ones that give the highest output signal amplitude. So for example, I got quite large signal amplitudes, but the switching node didn't look at all as expected, neither in this measurement or in this other one. The other thing to observe is that the practical values that I ended up using are very similar to the ones that I calculated, only a bit smaller. The main reason for this being that the various components and the way in which the circuit was built adds a bit of extra parasitic capacitance, which was not taken into account. So most likely, the extra 10 or so picofaras that I had to subtract are coming from various parasitic elements. But anyway, circuit works decently, let's move on with our test now. Using the fine-tuned values, it's time to see just how efficient our amplifier is. For that, on the one side I kept the oscilloscope to measure the output signal, and on the input, first of all I'm measuring the voltage that arrives at the power stage, and secondly, for the current, we can make two efficiency measurements, first one being the one in which we measure using the ammeter, only the current used by the power stage. So if we power up the circuit, turn on the signal generator, we can see our output waveform, circuit is supplied at 4.9 volts, drawing 84 milliamps, and it's outputting an RMS value of 3.99 volts, which is giving us an efficiency of about 77.7%. Next, we can turn off everything and look at the global efficiency of the amplifier. So not just taking into account the power stage, but also the transistor driving. So when we do this, we can see that our current has increased, the transistor driver is drawing a non-negligible amount of current, this is needed to charge and discharge the gate of the transistor, and well, with the new values, we are getting an efficiency of about 70%. So even though you can make classy amplifiers very efficient, th this one isn't. So I left the circuit running for about 10 minutes now, and to see exactly where the power is getting lost, we can look at it using a thermal camera. So when we look at the global circuit, we can see that, well, one of the inductors is heating up. It's the first inductor, the 12 microhenry one that's built with very thin wire. And other than that, if we have a closer look onto the board, we can see that the hottest component is not really the power transistor, but rather the gate driver. So because the circuit was fine tuned, the point of switching ensures very low losses on the transistor, the transistor itself is not losing all that much power, rather more power is getting wasted to actually try to drive the transistor into switching. So this is why it's very important to choose the right transistor for the specific application. Anyway, with a bit of care, the circuit could probably be made to work far more efficiently, and while the main hotspots can have their power reduced. Next thing we can look at is the bandwidth of the amplifier. Now, the circuit was designed for operation at 5 MHz, but just what is the range in which it can actually be used? For that, we can measure it using the oscilloscope and signal generator combo in body plot mode. 
But there's one thing to keep in mind. When performing this analysis, normally the signal generator will be outputting sine waves. But our circuit runs on square waves. So how can we get around this problem? Well, since we have our input logic gate with a trigger Schmidt input, this should not really be an issue. Any signal, regardless of its shape, will be turned into a square wave to drive the transistor. The only thing to look at is the duty cycle that reaches the transistor. So when we run the signal generator with an amplitude of 5 volts with the 5 MHz square wave, the signal that reaches our transistor is a square wave with about 50-51% of duty cycle, which is perfectly normal. But now when we switch to a sine wave with the exact same properties, so the same amplitude, the signal that reaches the transistor is, well, a square wave, but the duty cycle is about 68%, so not really good. So we need to adjust the parameters of our input sine wave so that we get the 50% duty cycle driving the transistor. So after playing around with the signal generator a bit, I managed to get my 50-51% duty cycle square wave driving the transistor, and this is obtained from a sine wave that has an amplitude of 2.3 volts, so a sine wave going between 2.3 and 0 volts. So this is the signal that we will be using in our Bode plot analysis. So after making the necessary setup adjustments, we can proceed with our measurement. So I'm performing this analysis from 4 MHz to 6 MHz at a rate of 200 points per decade. And once the measurement is concluded, we can go through the various points. And we can notice that our peak output amplitude, about 10 decibels, is not really obtained at 5 MHz, but rather 4.84. At 5 MHz, or anyway close to it, we are getting a slightly smaller amplitude. Now compared to this peak, at 10, if we consider the bandwidth to be minus 3 decibels, on one side we can go down to about 4.5 MHz, here we have 7.2 decibels of output amplitude, and at the other end, we can go to about 5.0 something, where we have again 7.3, 7.4 decibels. So even though the circuit was designed for 5 MHz, we have about 500 kHz, in which we have the specific amplitude and the value 3 decibels below it. But one interesting thing still stands. Why is this peak not at 5 MHz? Did I do something wrong with the measurement, or is something else going on? Well, for that we need to head back to the circuit simulator to see exactly why this is happening. So for that, I took the basic schematics from the two circuits that we simulated last time, so the class C amplifier with a Q factor of 10, and the one with a Q factor of 3, and I left these without any sort of output matching, just to get a clear picture of how the amplifier by itself is operating, and to be able to actually evaluate the two circuits, I prepared a set of measurement statements. So on the one hand, I'm measuring the output amplitude, so the peak to peak value, and on the other hand, I'm measuring the amplifier's efficiency by calculating the ratio between output and input power. And to get a better picture of the frequency behavior, I'm running this simulation from 3 MHz up to 6 MHz in steps of 100 kHz. So I'm varying the input signal. So if we run the simulation, we need to wait quite a bit. There's 31 runs that need to be concluded. So eventually the simulations are done and we can see the results in the error log. So here we see the results for the various measurement statements, and now we can right click and plot the measurement data. And here we can add the various traces. So the efficiency of the two circuits, and the output amplitude. So after rearranging the graphs a bit, we can see that both circuits, so both the one with the Q factor of 3 and the Q factor of 10, have an efficiency peak somewhere in the 5 MHz region. This is perfectly normal because the two circuits were designed to operate at 5 MHz. Now the other thing you can notice is that the output amplitude peak is not at 5 MHz. It's at a lower value, where the efficiency isn't all that great. So this is why the circuit should not be fine-tuned for large output values if you care about efficiency. Now the last thing to observe is that the circuit that was designed with a Q factor of 10 has a much tighter frequency range in which the efficiency is high, as well as a tighter frequency range in which the output amplitude is high, compared to the circuit with the Q factor of 3. 
But regardless, you can get the circuit to operate with relatively small deviations over a very wide frequency range. Depending of course on the Q factor for which you design the resonance circuit. Final thing to look at today is just how clean the output of the amplifier is. So for that, I kept the same setup with the amplifier supplied from the power supply and getting a signal from the signal generator, 5 MHz, and the output running through the attenuator is going into the spectrum analyzer. So I set it to measure between 4 MHz and 50. So we can see the fundamental and then the various harmonics. So if we turn on the generator, we can see the various spikes appearing. So we can clearly see our fundamental and then the first harmonic at 10 MHz. And well, to get a better view of the various values, we have this marker table feature and added markers on the four visible spikes. So we have our fundamental at 5 MHz at minus 15 dBm, then the first harmonic is at minus 53, then minus 71, and finally minus 88, minus 90. So the amplitude difference in between the fundamental and the first spike is about 38 decibels. Now, is this a good or bad value? Well, it depends on your application. If you need a stronger attenuation, then you will need more filtration. So this basic T-type matching network might not provide sufficient attenuation for your particular needs. But anyway, we are getting a reasonably close result to what we were observing in our simulation. In the end, the practical amplifier does work, even if it didn't really achieve the 500 milliwatts of output power that we designed it for. Most of the input power got lost on the various components, and therefore the efficiency wasn't as great as we hoped for. But just how good can you make such an amplifier if you actually take the time to properly select and dimension the components? Well, that's a topic for another time. So for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to get updated on videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.